This episode of Real Ag Radio is brought to you by Ag Expert. Go from field to farm with Canada's most trusted, most secure farm management software. Ag Expert keeps you on top of it all, no matter where you are. Get started for free at agexpert.ca. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and realagriculture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Tuesday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. And of course, as always, a big shout out to everybody else listening out there on the Real Lag Radio podcast, no matter where you are. Please continue to tell your friends, your family, anybody you know that is interested in agriculture. We are your one-stop shop when it comes to agricultural information. So uh, look forward to today's program. Uh, We're going to cover sort of some macroeconomic market topics with Jim McCormick. He is the founding partner at agmarket.net. They do some fantastic work when it comes to breaking down the the markets for for farmers across North America. So looking forward to talking to Jim today. I got some questions about this Black Sea grain deal. I want to ask him about you know China and some of their purchasing and what what's happening there and uh, try to translate all that back to you when it comes to marketing advice. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to Jim today. We're, we're also going to hear from Justin Funk of Real Agri Studies. Recently, we did a, a study on farm transition. And the part of the reason here was a little bit to, I, I guess we heard from RBC recently uh, on a report they did in terms of uh, you know the, the, the role that farm succession plays into this next step of the green economy. And or, or the Green Revolution, I think, is how John Stackhouse refers to it. And there were a few things in there that I was really curious. Oh, is that really the case? And so we, we did a survey, uh, and you participated out there. We very much appreciate that. We'll talk to Justin about some of the results. What did we find? What's in line with that RBC report? And what's maybe a little bit different? And where are some of the misconceptions that uh, the mainstream media, as they've grabbed a hold of this, uh, this uh, farm transition topic, uh, how they've maybe made some mistakes in, in terms of breaking some of the, the numbers down. So we'll do that. Also, uh, hey, it's uh, time for the top ag news stories of the day as well today. We'll, we'll get some of that in as well. If you have any feedback on today's program, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're, while you're doing that. Also, you can find us uh, by sending some feedback to the Real Ag Feedback Line. The number is 855-776-6147. Got a new poll up at realagriculture.com. It has to do with marketing. Yeah. So we're at that stage where, well, you should be thinking about some of your new crop marketing as you're getting that crop in the bin. And though some of you have already taken some action, I am sure. But for some of you, you're probably just kind of getting going. So very curious on 2023 new crop, this this crop we're about to uh, see launch out of the ground. How far are you in your in your crop marketing on a percentage basis of 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 this crop? Okay, so we ask, what percent of the 2023 crop do you have priced? Uh, you can choose very little, and then it kind of goes up in increments all the way up to more than 55 percent. Okay, so go to realagriculture.com and participate in our fun little poll. Uh, actually, there's 140 of you that have already. So uh, please join the fun and, and do that. Very, very curious. Just a fun, simple poll. And right now, half of you have done very little, which is interesting. Could be, and I wonder how much of that is weighted more to the prairies as opposed to in eastern Canada or parts of the U.S. Um, that, that would be obviously information we won't know. But uh, I think some of the hangovers there of 2021 has some people a little bit careful on how aggressive they get when it comes to some of this marketing. And we'll ask Jim about this too 
how aggressive should one be? Is this a kind of sell into the rally kind of market? Or is there an opportunity for us to uh, reverse course and head higher based on some more geopolitical or maybe fundamental factors? We'll talk to Jim McCormick about that with agmarket.net. When we come back, you're listening to Real Ag Radio. Boron is an essential micronutrient for plant growth. And without boron, your crops can't absorb the macronutrients they need for higher yields. Although borates occur naturally, boron deficiency is a common soil problem. Whether in direct soil application, through fertigation, or as a foliar spray, U.S. Borax has the right refined product for your crops. U.S. Borax products are specifically formulated to combine with other fertilizers, lowering your application costs. Learn more at borax.com slash egg. How's your seed quality? What should you treat with? What about herbicide carryover and environmental concerns? Spring is here, and you've got a lot of things to think about in regards to your pulse crop. The Pulse School on Real Agriculture has information and advice for all these questions and more to help you navigate this season. Brought to you by BASF. Pulse School episodes are available at PulseSchool.com, RealAgriculture.com, or as a podcast on your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. As I look out my, my studio window right now, one thing I do notice about the sky is, well, there's a bit of a wind today, but th- the other part is that we're seeing some of the smoke from those Alberta fires has, has been pushed south. So definitely definitely thinking about everybody that's being impacted by these fires and uh, hoping that everybody stays safe. And obviously, you're trying to take care of the livestock in some of those areas as well. Very, very tough times as uh, Alberta continues to deal with with wildfires. So uh, we need some rain. That would be a, a great help uh, for, for sure in that central Alberta region. Are you looking to simplify your sulfur solution on your farm? Get Biosol Premium Plus from GFL Ag, the unique combination of compost and elemental sulfur that provides a cost-efficient, logistically friendly, agronomically sound, long-term and environmentally friendly sulfur solution to your farm. Learn more at gflagra.com. That's G-F-L-A-G-R-I dot com. Let's talk some markets. We're joined right now by the founding partner of agmarket.net. It is Jim McCormick. Hey, Jim. Welcome. Hey, good morning, Sean. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, lots happening in the market right now. Uh, as we look at the, the markets at the time that we're doing this recording, a bit of a, I guess, I guess a mixed trade, quite a bit of red on the screen, probably more so than green. Um, what's happening here in this week of trade? Is this the market a little bit uncertain about what happens with this Black Sea grain deal going forward or what's, what's at work? Right now, I think there's a couple of things going on. The first thing I'd say is actually a little bit of concern about the cash market, Sean. Uh, yesterday in mid-session, especially in the corn market, the SIF value, the, the value of grain down at the Gulf kind of collapsed across the board and a lot, of, a lot of weakening of the basis. So I think there's a little bit of concern of demand, export demand specifically for U.S. products as Brazil continues to sell our products a little bit cheaper. So they're worried a little bit about demand. That's why we're under pressure right now. But the big concern and probably on the on the macro front, on the international front, is definitely this grain sea corridor. The shutdown, uh, what is it, the 18th is when the deal technically expires. I'm in the camp personally that I think they will shut it down. I think Putin's going to at least temporarily. Putin wants to wait and see how hard the G7 comes after him. If they come after him hard without any sanctions relief, I think he's going to try to squeeze squeeze the world a little bit. Um, the other thing, I think, you know, China was taking a lot of corn from the Ukrainians, but now the Chinese can take some of that corn from the Brazilians. They've got a big crop to export. Maybe that takes a little bit of pressure off Putin to keep the corridor open as well. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. If that does get shut down for a, a extended period of time, I think that would be a little bit friendly to all crops in the North American hemisphere as it'll shift the demand around to, or supply around of who can supply the world's food. Yeah, wasn't the tell last week when Ukraine's ag minister said that it wouldn't be a catastrophic event if that deal wasn't renewed? That the kind of when Ukraine's saying that, you you got to wonder where these talks are because there's actually I, I read in Reuters this morning there there's no talks planned to extend that agreement this week. So maybe this is already a little bit of a done deal. I, I think it's a I think it's baked in the cake right now. I think the fact is nothing can happen over the weekend, and I think now it's just where it's at. And now we're going to see how long it actually, you know, is it days, is it two days, is it a week, or is it a month? The longer it, it goes on, the more unnerving it will be probably for the world buyers. 
It, on the demand front, as you're alluding to, a bit of a weakness out there. Uh, is this based on the fact that, as you said, Brazil, there's you know some cheaper places to be buying some of these commodities? Or is there something more at work on the macroeconomic level where there's some concern about the global economy here as we've seen you know rates, I guess, you know, go up at a, at a pretty strong rate here the past 24 months? Well, there's two things that are probably at the forefront on the macro front right this moment, Sean. The first one here domestically, at least here in the the States, it's the debt ceiling. Um, We're racing toward that debacle really, really quick. Um, No one believes they're going to go over the guardrail and we will actually default on the U.S. debt. But let's face it, a lot of weird things have happened the last few years where people said, oh, that'll never happen. And it's happened. So I think there's a little bit of uncertainty about if that would happen, what would that do economically? I think in general, the consensus is it would be very negative, econ- you know, the, the U.S. economy, which would spill in the world. So I think that's partly what's dragging the market a little bit. The other thing is coming up, news coming out of China. They're just their economy did not have that COVID rebound like a lot of the economies of the world did when they come out of lockdown. They're, they're, the growth's not there. There were some reports now that unemployment for um, you know, a, you know, adults, young adults, roughly age to 25 is like 20, 25%. There's more, you get the college grads that are just coming out of school here the next couple of weeks. And um, that just shows you the world's, you know, the China, the kind of the big engine for the world's demand over the last decade is slowing down. And that's a little bit of a concern. And, you know, that's a concern here in the States for the bean exports specifically. We ship a lot of beans to China. If their economy is not growing, they're going to, their bean export number might be overstated and we might see more cuts in the, in the exports to uh, China. Jim, how much, how much weight do you put in the discussion about the concerns of certain countries, you know, buying commodities in the, the Chinese yuan instead of the U S dollar? Uh, it, is that something that uh, is taking up a lot of your headspace as you try to break down this uh, everything that's happening geopolitically right now? Well, I think it's a concern. If you, I, I think it is a concern. But the the reality is, you know, that's the transition of history. If you look over the history arcs of history, there have been other currencies that were the dominant currency. Um, the United States, you know, we are not, you know, we may have the most, one of the strongest economies, one of the strongest militaries. But, you know, when you get in this conflict that we've had with the Chinese the last couple of years, you, you know, the Chinese are going to try to wean them way away from it. Um, I'm not quite fearful of it, though. I think it's something we need to be concerned about. But the reality is, if someone needs our product, we're going to take dollars to buy it. If you want our corn, you're going to take dollars, you know, they'll convert it back into it. You know, so the fact that they're, you know, the Pakistanis are trading, you know, buying Chinese good and Chinese currencies. It's something you don't like to see if a U.S. American. But the reality is that's probably the arc we're going to go on. And that's just the as the world history goes around. That's usually what happens. You know, the world moves from one currency to another. It just does. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from a domestic planting standpoint, uh, how do you break down those USDA planting progress reports? We're we're running way ahead of schedule, plain and simple. I mean, if you look at it compared to last year, compared to the averages, this crop is getting into the field at a very, very rapid pace for the most part. The northern tier states closer to the Canadian borders are probably struggling the most. But as a whole, we're off to a relatively good start. Um, there is some rain out there. I mean, you're not here. We've had some replants going on in parts of Illinois and Indiana. Where we've had too much rain over the last couple of weeks. But overall, this crop looks good. And if you look at that, unfortunately, in the pricing sector, I, I think that means we're probably going to get most of these acres anticipated planted. History is kind of bearish for us right just now. We are moving into El Nino, Sean, very, very fast by all accounts. Um, one stat that I heard from one weather forecaster said, out of the 17 years we've had El Nino during the growing seasons, 14 of them, we ended up with trend yield or better in the United States. Now, trend yield is 181 and a half as a mathematical trend yield. That is about five bushels better than we ever had. So the market's kind of taken that, well, are we really gonna hit trend with kind of a grain of salt? But the history is on the bare side that you do hit that 181, 181 and a half potentially. You take that 181 and a half with 90, 91, or 91, 92 million planted acres, 92 is a working number, maybe shave it back even a million. You're still looking at a 2 billion, 2.1, 2.2 billion carryout potentially. That is essentially probably is going to push corn prices on the board of trade into the low fours by the fall if that does come to fruition. 
if you're banking on the weather market for some of these spring planted crops, it it's it's not working out that way based on the planting progress and kind of what the weather patterns are at this point. It's it's a yep. little bit of a concern. For I would agree. I, I would agree. If you were looking for the hey, maybe we're not going to get a planted rally. That that rally seems to have moved on at the point at this point for the most part. Can we get a rally now? Historically, if you look in years 2013 is a year we like kind of use as an analog year this year, and other years you tend to get pushes back up roughly between now and the middle of the latter part of June. Let's just say you know Independence Day, in the United States, July Fourth weekend. You tend to get weather rallies. You know that'll happen in most years. Those are rallies that we're encouraging producers out there to really get aggressive about because usually weather rallies do not last. And if you do get it, it's probably going to be short-lived just based on this El Nino study that we have. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, where could that rally come from? It could come from the shutting down the grain corridor. That could be what kind of gets market excited. China coming in unexpectedly buying a lot of grain. South America, interesting, um, Sean, is they're a little bit dry in parts of the Safrina corn crop as they're running as they're running the latter part of that crop out. Does that get the market a little bit excited? And then the western part of the United States, the western corn belt, in the, according to the drought monitor, is still quite dry, even though they've had rain recently. So those are the reasons that you might get the market get a, a little too wet, too dry, too cold type of bounce. But, you know, history says that bounce needs to be aggressively marketed. But, and and that, yeah, okay, that's that's the key point here. The 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 tail of the bounce or, you know, trying to put together a justification where we could see a little bit of maybe a couple upside days or mm-hmm. maybe a week. Those are an opportunity, you know, a selling opportunity as opposed to transitioning back into what we had the, basically the past two, three years, which has been this buy and hold strategy where all of the strength is in the seller's hands. That that has really we've transitioned to a different kind of marketing market at this point. You nailed it. The reality is the boat's turned. We are no longer in a bull market. In general, we believe we're more in a bear market. We are in a stocks building market. Um, the market's going to pay you storage more than likely as we get into fall, store grain into the spring and summer. It's just the cycle of agriculture. When you think about what happens, we've had a very tight supply in the United States. We've had tight supply around the world. And that has driven the prices to astronomically, historically high levels. The war was probably the apex of it like a year ago now we're going to come out of that and what happens the world responded to these dry you know to these rallies supply driven rallies by essentially increasing supply we've got a big safrina corn crop potentially a big u.s corn crop we'll see how canada comes out canada's a little bit dry here and there but in general the world supply if you look at what the government's suggesting the world carryouts are starting to grow so we're moving more into a long-term bear market the energy market continues to struggle. Um, you know, crude oil can't get much over eighty dollars. Everyone, every time it does, it gets smacked back down. Um, you know, you know, the crude oil tends to be the canary in the coal mine for the overall commodities. You know, if China's economy is going to start to roll into life, roll into life, you'll see it in the energy markets first. You know, and the energy markets tend to kind of pull all the markets up. The energy markets have been struggling right now. Nat gas is at dirt cheap prices. You're hearing yeah. we're taking Nat gas rigs offline at some of the quickest pace we've ever seen right now as the market's trying to essentially stem the flood of Nat gas on the world market at the moment. So all those, unfortunately, are kind of negative indicators for the commodity markets. And like I said, I think that lends our group to believe that rallies really need to be meant to be sold for the American agriculture, even for anybody who's producing, because we could oversupply ourselves into 2023 and really set ourselves up into some frustrating times for 2024, because the price is Sean is probably going to go down, but the reality is the cost of labor is probably not going to go down. Um, with inflation, it's still running around five percent. Even if they get it down to three or four, you know, the employees are still going to want their raises. Land rent probably isn't going to go down much. The cost of land isn't, you know, we don't, as I say, they don't make more of it. Rent's not going to drop. So what's going to happen is the prices of your product is going to go down if agricultural commodities are going to go down. But your cost of producing, it's not yeah. going to drop as much. And it's going to make 2024 that much harder to cash flow. Well, I was just going to ask you about inflation. So there, there has to be some... I'm sure there's a lag here. But as we see weakness in the energy markets, and of course, we're seeing the bearish tone to the egg commodity complex, That you know, those, those are the inputs for the engine of the economy. 
does this mean six months out or 12 months out that we really start to see uh, inflation here really tail off and maybe we get a little bit closer to that two to three percent window that would be more of the target for the Fed or, or like the Bank of Canada? I think that's what you're going to see. And remember, that's the goal of this. I mean, that's the yeah. reality is, I mean, the, the Fed has told us all along they're going to slow down the economy. That was the whole key was raising interest rates, make it more expensive to do business that slows down the economy. And as you slow down the economy, you are going to essentially get a little bit of deflation to get it down to closer to the inflation number they want. Now, how long does it take? It may, you know, in the ag sector, it takes a little bit longer for that cycle to happen. But you are, we believe you're seeing that cycle. And the old line is you don't fight the Fed. You don't fight the Bank of Canada. They usually get the way they want. Maybe not as fast, Maybe not as quick as we like, but normally, you know, they have the strings that to either increase, you know, to stimulate this economy or slow it down. And right now, the inflation is still the key. Now, I think we're just kind of at the tipping point. We've got inflation right around 5%. The Fed rates right around 5%. So we're probably where we're going to pause it. But that's still too high on the inflationary aspect. So I think they're just going to keep slowing this economy down. Until they get it close to that target rate, somewhere you know the average rate, in, in, you know inflation rate, somewhere around two percent. Yeah, and just because they pause now, we saw this with Australia last week or the week before, where they were paused, and then all of a sudden they're raising rates again based on the data that they're seeing. So this is definitely a fluid situation. Just because they pause now doesn't mean hey that's the strategy going forward, and hey re reduce rates are are right in front of us. They're, this is definitely a, a moving situation. Something that especially with all the the, the money that is borrowed in agriculture, we're definitely paying attention to interest rates. There is no doubt about that. Jim, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. All the best to you and everybody at agmarket.net. How do, how do people get a hold of you? Um, best way to reach us is go to agmarket.net or go to 844-424-6758. But you know, if you're interested in looking at our research, agmarket.net. This is two weeks in a row from my memory that we have heard the market analysts that we talked to here on the show say, sell into the rally. Opportunity. Right. So, the, the, and, and if that's the case, let, let's assume that is correct advice. It means you got to be more on top of some of the daily trade. Right. When, when we were in the buy and hold, I'll, I'll I'm just going to, it's sitting in my bin. It's all good. I'm going to check on the market in three months and, and see when it's, you know, corn's two bucks higher. Right. We, we're not in that kind of market. So this is where either we have to be following the trade on a daily basis, at least seeing the movement of the market, or two, we need to put price price targets in place. And, and because if you do the third option, which is don't pay attention and want to see, you know, hey, it's going to reverse, it's going to get better. I'm not going to pay attention because if if I'm going to be sucked in to selling too much of my crop, and so I'm going to ignore it. And I'm going to enjoy the fruits three months from now when the market's higher. It doesn't feel like the third option is a good idea here at the right at this point. Now, that may prove to be wrong, but you got to also play the probabilities. You got to play the probabilities. And right now, this is the probability. I think you know what we heard from Jim McCormick this week is is how a lot of people are lining up here right now. So, getting back to that poll, fifty percent of you have sold very little of this crop at this point. I'm not telling you what to do. But you need to pay attention to some of this uh, daily trade of this market in in this kind of this kind of part of of the cycle. So we'll see where everything goes. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, um, we're going to talk about something that happened 20 years ago. Time flies, but boy, has it, it's still impacting us today. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147. We're on Sirius XM. Infuse some energy into your next corporate event, customer meeting, or conference with Real Ag Radio, Canada's national agriculture radio show. Create a unique experience at your next event with host Sean Haney, broadcasting Real Ag Radio live on Sirius XM, featuring exciting guests, captivating interviews, and the latest news from the agriculture community. Contact advertising at realagriculture.com or call 587 787 1795 to book your on location with Real Ag Radio today. As you head out into the field this season, 
The Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Did you know that Pioneer now has a full lineup of Enlist E3 soybeans? Take a look at Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans for the highest yield potential and for the best agronomic package and herbicide trade options. From the lab to the field, Pioneer brand Enlist E3 soybeans are the best in beans, period. Ask your local Pioneer representative about Enlist E3 beans. Coming very quickly here in June, actually June 4th to the 6th in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, is the 110th AGM and convention of the Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association. Registration is now open. Visit skstockgrowers.com for more information and to register. One of the topics that I, I would assume is going to get discussed there is, is more reflective in nature. But it does actually have impact still today and on the go forward. Can you believe that it is 20 years since the BSE crisis in Canada? That is amazing. And, and what's even more amazing how it just seems like yesterday in, some, in so many ways. The other part of it is, is it still has an impact. We heard last week on the Farmer Rapid Fire, a uh, farmer from the Maritimes basically say, yeah, like, you know, we've never really recovered our, our beef business in in Nova Scotia or in the Maritimes since the BSE crisis. We're 20 years removed, people. It still has an impact. Canada is still searching. How many times have I asked Ann Wasco during the beef market update, what is it going to take to expand this cow herd? This whole discussion, and listen, the U.S., you talk about the same stuff. So, would we have a cow herd size issue if there hadn't been BSE? I'm going to guess Yes. Would it be as profound? That's a good question. It's something I should ask Ann Wasco about. But uh, you, you got to wonder. I'm not, I'm not really sure if it would have. Now, the, I think as we're, we, we think about being 20 years removed from this incident, and if you can believe it, it was May 20th of 2003, and it was a, it was a black Angus cow from northern Alberta that had been found to have BSE. And immediately, the United States closed its border to Canadian beef and cattle. And then 40 countries followed suit. Now, you got to think about that. The work that had to happen behind the scenes to reinstate an open border when 40 countries close it to your product. Do you think we had a glut of product and beef here in, in Canada? And, and I, I think it's in the news here coming up. But um, the, the other piece of this, too, is that you know, we, we started to see people selling. We had reefer. I remember here in West Lethbridge, there's a Safeway. And in that Safeway, the reefers would pull in there, and they were selling beef out of the back of the trailer to try to support the Canadian beef industry. Also in the timeline, June 17th, so almost a month later, Federal Agriculture Minister Lyle Van Cleef announced the beef industry compensation package, cost shared with the provinces. It was $460 million in size. A, a day later, he also announced changes to slaughter rules. Um, I, I believe, if I can remember right, we could all of a sudden uh, trade uh, across per provincial lines, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, in those changes, though, the cattle tissues at high risk to carry BSE, notably brain and spinal cord, must be removed at the slaughterhouse from cattle that were older than two years old. And then by August 8th, okay, so now we're in the early parts of summer, we're June, July, we're, we're like two and a half months after the border shut. U.S. and Mexico partially lift the ban on some Canadian beef products. So th this just shows you how impactful that border slamming shut, two and a half months long, and the impacts that has now 20 years later. It it's phenomenal. By 
the end of the year, December 23rd, right before Christmas, U.S. Agriculture Secretary Ann Veneman announced the first U.S. case of mad cow as well. It was in Washington state. About 30 countries eventually closed their border to U.S. beef. Canada imposed a partial ban. So uh, there, there's a really good, um, if you, you know, search BSE crisis in Canada, there's a lot of different sites that have uh, timelines to, to discuss it and show it. But it, oh boy, it, it, it had impact. Now, what I want to hear from you is I want to hear your BSE stories, your memories. How do you reflect back on it? You know, I, I, and I'll, I'll just share one thought that comes to my mind. I will never forget, we were, uh, at that time we had a feed yard. Our family had a feed yard. And uh, of course, very concerned. My dad got a phone call from somebody saying, uh, Tur, you're, you're going to want to have the TV on this afternoon. Strap yourself down because there's bad news coming. So you kind of have a bit of a tip from, from a relationship of his. Okay. So you're like, what's going on? So we heard the news. Oh, and, and, and at the time you're like, oh my, like, oh, and had other words to say too, but didn't really realize, I think, at some of the repercussions that were going to come very, very quickly. And remember that morning when it hit the news wires, we were buying a skid steer. And I can't remember how much the skid steer was, but uh, I'm going to hesitate. I, I think it was like 50 grand, but I, I, I that might be wrong. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We The, the salesman from from finning was in our office and we were buying a skid steer. And, uh, we, I remember having the discussion. We thought, you know what? We committed to the skid steer. We shouldn't walk away from it. And we, we went through, I remember my dad making a big deal, about the fact that we were honoring this deal and we were moving forward, probably should have canceled the skid steer <laughs> in retrospect. But uh, I remember that whole process that morning and, and us and many people not really realizing the road and the path that all of this was going to go down through the early part of that summer in 2003. I want to hear your stories about BSC. You know, did you did you used to have pears? Did did you used to have you know? Say you were in the beef business. Maybe, you know, was your farm at one point uh, a different? You know, had, had multiple operations in it. You know, you farmed in the summer. You you ranched in the winter. Tell me them stories. We want to hear from you. We'll, we'll discuss them as we get later in the week when we do the farmer rapid fire. I'm going to ask some of the I'm going to ask some of the farmers that uh, we talked to about you know to try to reflect on 20 years because it's um, it's something that's so much in the past yet still so present in people's minds. And you you know, you want to talk about tra- about a traumatic event that there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a, a, a major major, major mental costs on people steering through that two and a half months when that border was closed. And, and probably still, you know, it's when you, when you talk about it, it's, it does sort of, you get a bit of a tingle in terms of just the impact. It, we don't, we don't see agricultural events creating like, you know, when China banned canola, not the same thing <laughs> at all. Right. When, when we talk about China having restrictions on Canadian plants, when it comes to beef exports, not the same thing. So uh, you can share your stories by going to S or send me an email at S Haney at real agriculture.com. Or you can call that real ag feedback line. I would really appreciate it. If you did eight, five, five, seven, seven, six, six, one, four, seven. When we come back, we're going to hear from Justin Funk. We're talking about farm transition. When we come back, you're listening to real ag radio. Want to get the best out of your soybean crops? Whether you've been growing them for a generation or are just starting into soybeans, find what you need to know at SoybeanSchool.com. You'll see videos on growing tips, pest control, and much more from specialists across the region, all in one place. Easy for you to access from your desktop, tablet, or mobile phone. Maximize your yields by staying up to date with the Soybean School, presented by BASF, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. 
If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Tuesday. Let me tell you about Alpine Premium Liquid Fertilizers for Canadian farmers. Over the past 50 years, Alpine has developed broad Canadian roots. They strive to maximize fertilizer efficiency to support farmers and their communities with high-quality liquid fertilizers from start to finish. To learn more, contact them at alpinepfl.com. That is alpinepfl.com. A lot of talk in the, I guess, the mainstream media about uh, farm transition and who will take over the farms of the future. Well, this month, it just so happens that Real Agri Studies uh, looked into this to try to, I guess, uh, shed some light on what is actually happening on Canadian farms when it comes to farm succession and farm transition. Here to talk about the results is Justin Funk of Real Agri Studies. Hey, Justin, how are you doing? I'm well, Sean. How are you? I'm doing really good. And the Blue Jays uh, didn't look too great last night against the Yankees, but we swept the Braves. And uh, you're going to the game tonight, too. I am going to the game tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Good for you. I'm super jealous. I'll I'll I'll, I'll be watching on TV and I will look out for you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's dive into it. Um, now, when we look at what farmers said in regards to do I have a written succession plan? What? How do those percentages break down? Yeah. So f- first of all, when when we did the survey, uh, which was conducted at the end of April. Uh, the very first question we asked was, are you a single generation farm or a multi-generation farm? And about two thirds of the respondents indicated they were multi-generational. So indicating that there was more than one generation farming together on the same farm. Of that group, 37% indicate that they have a written transition or succession plan. Wow. And okay, now... What, the ones that don't, what what do they have then? Could they have a, a a transition plan in like in I guess verbally or it's it's a, well on a napkin it would be written. But what, what what are the others doing? Well, first of all, in 2016 we did a study at Purdue called the Multi Gen Farm Study, and we saw pretty similar numbers to this. You know, in that time span, farms have been going through transition. So, I mean, there are farms that don't have a written plan that are transitioning just fine. So, I think that the way we are interpreting this is that it's either, well, it's formalized with a written plan doesn't necessarily mean that they're not thinking about it. They're not going through the adequate processes associated with successful farm transition. So, uh, uh, one of the other questions we asked was, are you working with uh, external advisors? To help you through transition. Here we saw the numbers were completely flipped around. 64% said yes, they were. So, you know, just because somebody doesn't have a written transition plan doesn't mean that they're not going to be transitioning the farm or transitioning the farm successfully. Yeah, I think that's one of the big misinterpretations out there is we've seen a lot of mainstream media, you know, try to cover, well, it was in the RBC report. Let's just, you know, be clear about that. And it was covered a lot. And there was sort of this, this take where, you know, land is going to go unfarmed, that there's nobody to take, we have a people issue, there's nobody to take over the, the farms of the future. What What our survey showed is that actually, wasn't it like 2% of people said that there's really 
no plan after the current farmer? Like it was, it was a very, very low amount. It was 2%. So of the multi-generational farms, we ask essentially, where are you in the process? Uh, have you not started? Are you just getting started? Are you in the middle? Have you finished for the time being? And that's something else that I want to uh, emphasize here. Succession planning is not something that has a definitive conclusion, right? Once you finish one phase of the process, you essentially begin the next, assuming there's another generation coming along. Only 2% of farms said that the farm was winding down and would not be going through transition. Now, you just compare that to the single generational farms. So that's another subset of our sample, right? Because that was the first question somebody answered, am I single or multi-gen? So 37% of these farms said that they were single generation. But then we went on to ask them, well, what's the status of your single generational farm? And 60% said, we're going to be single generation for a while. And by the way, the average age of that respondent was 60 years old. So, I mean, it, 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 my assumption here is that they still have quite a long time to farm. So this is not a necessarily an immediate thing. But then 27% said, there's another generation that's coming up soon. When we asked them how soon, we're looking within a six-year time frame. Yeah. So, you know, I, th this is going to happen uh, sooner than we expect. And just because somebody isn't defined as a multi-gen farm right at this very minute doesn't mean that they're not going to be in the next, you know, one to six years. Yeah, you could have somebody that's farming with their dad. Dad retires. So they move from multi-gen to single-gen. But they have a daughter that's in high school that intends to come back to the farm after college. And then that single generation farm then transitions to multi-generation farm. This is, this is a, sort of like a, a living, breathing organism when we, when you, when, when we look at this. Um, it, it very much is. And just one other thing, the, of the single gen farms, 14% said we recently transitioned. So they've just gone through it. They're single gen now. And probably for the foreseeable future, but, but they've successfully gone through transition. And by the way, the average age of that farmer was 50 years old. Uh, a lot has been made about the age of the farmer. And uh, as you look at some of the age demographics and how people answered some of the these transition questions, is there something that sticks out for you when it comes to the age of the farmer? Uh, based on what farmers told us? There was one in particular, and, and I think that this is interesting and not necessarily just exclusive to farmers. We ask, at what age do you plan to retire? And it, it was, it, we had before 60 and then a number of other incremental categories up to older than 75. And, and only 4% said before 60, 26% said older than 75, and then the rest was in the middle. When we look at that by age, though, there is a distinct relationship that exists that says the younger I am, the earlier my intentions are to retire. And you can almost follow it to a T that as the age brackets increase, so does that target age of retirement. Uh, that was the one that really stuck out to me. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and, and, I, and I can see why that might be the case. But when you get to 65 and over, of course, you know, it's very clear that if somebody intends to be farming, that their retirement age is going to exceed 65. And, and when we talk to farmers about the barriers, because th this is not an easy process. Like there's, it, there's family members, there's on-farm siblings, off-farm si uh, off siblings. There's this, this, this tussle of what's fair is not equal and what's equal is not fair. Trying to balance all of that, trying to keep the family unit together so people talk to each other. There's challenges. When we ask farmers yeah. about the barriers for them, what did they tell us? The biggest barrier was identified as tax implications. Uh, and, and so that's kind of a hard one to, to get around. And, you know, definitely a reason why, and, and we identified this, you know, the large percentage of farmers that were working with an external advisor, and many of those advisors were identified as being accountants and lawyers. Um, but tax implications was the biggest one, but a close second was lack of communication. Mm. And, and so here we've got the difference between a money barrier and, uh, and more of a behavioral barrier. Yeah, great stuff. Now, if somebody wants to, I, I guess, hear more about the full results of this, go to realagrastudies.com. We, we don't, uh, 
we're putting a video up where people can uh, check it out and, and kind of go through all these high level results. So go to real studies. Dot com. If you have any challenges in finding it, just send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Justin, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. And go Jays go, right? All right. You yeah. got it. Leafs are out. Oilers are out. Hockey's a distraction, folks. It's all about Blue Jays baseball now. And uh, we got a good team. So I know you're enjoying some of those games out there when you're ripping around the field with the cedar or the planter. When we come back on Real Ag Radio, we're going to dive into the top ag news stories of the day. You're listening to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147. I get to spend every day talking to farmers in the ag industry through realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. But nothing is more fun than speaking to an audience live and in person. If you're planning an ag event, book a real agriculture speaker to make it a successful and memorable experience. Email shaney at realagriculture.com and you can book myself or any other real ag personality to speak at your event. Bring your audience all the fun, insight, and energy of real agriculture. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. In case you're wondering, boy, Sean sounds a little bit different today. It, I I am under the weather, so uh, thanks for bearing with me. I <laughs> hope you haven't heard any of my coughs or grunts or anything like that. But and it is my birthday today, as Lindsay Smith has been making a big deal of. So yeah, and being under the weather on your birthday is uh, ah, what's going on? Those two things shouldn't happen. But uh, thanks for bearing uh, with me here and f- helping me fight through this. Let's get to the top egg news stories of the day. And first, though, I want to tell you about Granny Boar from U.S. Borax. Ask for it by name. Go to borax.com. Okay, top uh, story in the news I have here is Statistics Canada said uh, today the annual pace of inflation rose in April for the first time since it peaked in June last year. Uh oh, this is going the wrong direction. Story in the Globe Mail says the agency said it c- consumer price index was up 4.4 percent compared with a year ago, up from a year-over-year increase of 4.3 percent in March. StatsCan said in the first tick, sorry, said the first tick higher in the annual rate since it peaked at 8.1 percent in June 2022 was driven by higher mortgage interest costs, which were up 28.5 percent compared with a year ago, due to higher interest rates. A 6.1 percent increase in rent prices also also help push the overall rate up. That's kind of like a circular discussion, right? If interest rate costs are creating a higher CPI, then we have to raise interest rates to try to kill inflation that's been caused by higher interest rates. Uh, Obviously, that doesn't make up the entire CPI, but that, that feels like a little bit of a circular discussion. Meanwhile, grocery prices, which have been closely watched, were up 9.1% compared with a year ago, but that increase was smaller than the 9.7% year over year number that jumped in March. Uh, Gas prices in April were down 7.7%. We'll take that. Uh, Also, prices for fresh vegetables in April were up 8.8%. Uh, and uh, that number was 10.8 in in March. I mentioned during the discussion with Jim McCormick of AgMarket.net that uh, the UN and Turkey brokered the the you know the last number of Black Sea grain deal agreements. It doesn't really look like we're going to have a renewal of this 60 day version. There are no new talks planned for this week, so definitely continue to follow that story this week for sure. The University of Guelph Department of Food, Agricultural Resource Economics within the Ontario Agricultural College has announced a $1 million research chair. So the Errol Family Chair in Behavioral and Experimental Economics will support students in seed projects and enable the hiring of a lab manager for a growing research lab. The new chair will be held for five years by FAIR Professor Dr. Dr. Lee, I think is, is how you say her name, whose field and lab research aims to couple economic theory with human behavior. So that's good to see that new research chair at the University of Guelph. 
Once sleeping giants, Alberta's wildfires are threatening to show the full extent of their power, according to the CBC. High temperatures have been unrelenting in recent days, and no rain is in the forecast. While temperatures will ease somewhat in the week ahead, the changing forecast is expected to bring new dangers. A shift in wind direction could lead to unpredictable wildfire behavior, according to... Wildfire Information Officer Christy Tucker in a news conference on Monday afternoon. Like I mentioned earlier, there's definitely some smoke in the air here in Southern Alberta as, as that smoke is being pushed to the south. Savita Genetics has received regulatory approval for Alanova, a non-GMO high oleic soybean variety, a food-grade soybean industry first for Canada. So the variety available for planting this growing season is also tolerant to soybean cis nematode, according to Savita. It is a mid-to-late-season variety suitable for Ontario and Quebec growing conditions. If you're tuning into the mainstream news, you are going to hear a lot about this debt ceiling issue in the U.S. And when I say it's a debt ceiling issue, that's probably understated. U.S. President Joe Biden is ready to discuss the debt ceiling with congressional leaders at the White House in a high-profile session with reverberations across the globe as early outlines of a potential deal begin to emerge despite painstakingly slow negotiations. Both sides have really not shown a willingness to want to negotiate because they're worried that somehow this would be somehow seen as weakness on their side. And look, you know, they want to be tough. Well, we're going to find out if, if this debt ceiling issue comes to roost, we're going to find out how tough the American economy is. And it's going to have some spillover into places like Canada. So raising the stakes, the Tuesday afternoon session comes as Biden is preparing to depart for a group of seven summit in Japan, where the U.S. leadership will be on the world stage later this week. I mean, a lot of questions about this. Huge repercussions. Biden remains optimistic, saying over the weekend there's a desire on on their part as well as others to reach an agreement. Well, I would bloody well hope so. Bloody well hope so. Speaking of that G7 summit, You see, yesterday, Pierre Polyev, leader of the opposition party in Canada, was questioning why the Canadian government, specifically Deputy Minister Freeland, was headed to Japan. You know, I I think his line was, well, this government's in the air. Canadians are on the ground here, essentially saying that they should be instead staying home to talk to Canadian. And he said common people, which I think that's a weird way to put that. Um, and suggesting they shouldn't go to the G7. My opinion, my opinion, that is ludicrous. Ludicrous at, at, at this time. Imagine the message sent to allies. If Canada said, by the way, we're going to insulate, we're going to, you know, we got some problems at home. We can't travel. Like, uh, what? <laughs> Come on. That, that's what we've, that's what we've now resorted to our domestic politics to. It, it's nonsense. So I, 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 as it came out of his mouth, he had to be thinking nonsense. I'm not sure he did, but yes, Canada should be going to the G7. There's, there's just no question about that. Americans are keeping their cars longer than ever. The average age of a passenger vehicle on the road hit a record 12 and a half years old this year. According to data gathered by the S&P Global Mobility, sedans like Holdsworths are even older on average at 13 point six years. Blame it mainly on the pandemic, which in 2022 triggered a global shortage of automotive computer chips, the vital component to power some of these vehicles. I I think emissions maybe has something to do with it a little bit too, I I would assume. Prices reach record highs and and though they've eased somewhat, the cost of vehicles still feels punishingly expensive to many Americans, especially when coupled with now much higher loan rates. So once again, this and this is what you know Jim talked Jim McCormick talked about this. This is what these interest rate hikes were meant to do. Slow the economy. It, all of this has pushed the national average monthly of auto, or sorry, a national average monthly auto loan payment to $729, prohibitively high for many. Uh, you see uh, used combines are now more expensive than new combines. The world is turned upside down. If you have any feedback on today's show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com or call that Real Ag feedback line. It's very simple, 855-776-6147. I would love to hear your stories this week, your memories of the BSC crisis and what happened on your farm or ranch 
we'd love you to share those and we'll uh, we'll talk about them as the week progresses as we hit the 20 year anniversary on Saturday May 20th thanks everybody for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio and we'll of course chat again tomorrow cheers everybody thank you for downloading this episode of Real Ag Radio brought to you by Ag Expert go from field to farm with Canada's most trusted most secure farm management software Ag Expert keeps you on top of it all no matter where you are Get started for free at agexpert.ca.